Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Caleb Spears. I'm in the, the physics department. Uh, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Eric Blue. I, this is the first time that I've sort of done this pair of guys. Uh, but Eric Brew is an associate professor in physics and in science education at Drexel University. So that's two departments, right? Yeah. Um, his work in modeling instruction has sort of reshaped the way that uh, many universities teach their physics courses. Um, in addition to curriculum development, though, um, he's had a focus on the effect of the curriculum. So he's worked in uh, not just understanding how it helps students to understand physics better, uh, but how it affects their participation, how it affects the retention uh, in, in school, um, how it affects persistence and equity. So he's done a lot of work in understanding what his curriculum is doing to his students. Um, and it's all good. <laughs> um, in addition to that, he's been pretty active in the community. He's co-edited a focus collection on gender and physics for the uh, Physical Review Journal, uh, special topic, or it's not special topics anymore, but no. in physics education research. And he's also on the editorial board now for that journal. Uh, he was recently awarded an APS fellow, right? Is that right? It's true. Yeah, it's true. Um, like in 2019, so recently. Uh, I think I, I got it wrong I, on my CV. It oh, was 18. But I didn't get the thing until 2019, so that's right. Yeah, I, you know. It's like I really graduated in 2019, or 18, but I got the diploma. Uh, oh yeah, you really did. I was like, yeah, you've graduated a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly new at this. So, um, lastly, though, and, and perhaps more importantly, if you talk to Eric, you'll you'll understand very quickly that he's just a very good person, um, very fair, and uh, very concerned. I think uh, so. I'm embarrassed to this, but um, but there's that. So enjoy this, um, and uh, there will be time for some questions afterwards. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Now I'm going to not live up to it. Uh, okay, so I am uh, an associate professor in physics and science education at Drexel. Um, I start every talk by acknowledging that the work that I do and have done is not my work alone. This is my current research group. Um, the Drexel PER network and uh, important input from uh, others at Drexel. And uh, I've spent three years at Drexel, but spent a number of years at Florida International. And it's two slides of acknowledgments is too much. But I don't forget you, Florida International. Um, so physics education research is, uh, in many ways, and, and now that uh, University of New England has two really great resources. Um, Caleb is a friend and a collaborator. We've written a grant together. He's a really smart guy. So if you are interested, work with him. And Jamie has been uh, a friend for a long time. I mean, I've known you probably for almost 20 years is my guess. Um, and an outstanding modeler. Uh, so... Uh, physics education research is really about sort of two things that are that are overlapping. One is about improving instruction in the physics classroom, and the other is at a more fundamental level, trying to understand learning and the processes processes by which learning happens. And so, for me, um, what that means is, in terms of the improving instruction, I've worked. Uh, extensively on modeling instruction, which I'll talk about as the, the crux of the talk today, but also trying to conduct research in the context of the modeling instruction classroom and uh, affiliated effects. Um, so I'm going to start talking just sort of theoretically. Uh, that I'm going to make the, the argument that science is a modeling endeavor that really when we are doing science, we are doing things like trying to understand bizarre particles flying out of Antarctica's ice. They might shatter modern physics. And so this is a case where evidence is challenging one of the sort of standardly held models. Other models are things like, we have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe, warns the United Nations. So we might be doing models to, to predict the future, 
We might ge be generating climate models that help us understand how the future might be. And sometimes we make models just to understand the really important parts of life. So, if science is a modeling endeavor, and that's, you know, if there's a slide about bacon, you know it's true, then we ought to be careful about what we mean by that. And so I think that science is about constructing new models, testing and validating models, deploying models to new situations. So, um, you know, uh, how, do we, how, do we under, how does our model for climate change generate new predictions about, you know, our time uh, left? And then ultimately revising models. If we want, if we see new bizarre particles flying out of the Antarctic ice, what do we do about that? How does that change us? And so if those are the things that builds up science as an endeavor, then what should science education really look like? And my feeling is that we ought to be thinking about the following questions. What should students be doing? What should instructors be doing? And what should the curriculum sort of look like? And so I want you to spend just two minutes talking to each other. Say, what do you think? What kinds of things should, should we be teaching in our classes? And are those the things we are teaching? So you've got one minute. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Oh my god. Oh yeah, you're so excited. All right. This is this is my colloquium. So I'm, I'm driving the bus. So I get to give my answers, but I, they won't surprise you. So what should students be doing? Well, first of all, students need to be active participants. If we are constructing models, you don't do that by sitting and passively listening to, to things. They need to be investigating phenomena, representing things in new ways, testing models, solving problems. They need to ultimately just be building models. And instructors, our jobs are not necessarily to, to tell, to, to pass along information. That's what the internet and apparently Chegg is for. Um, instead, we should be guides. We should be thinking about what is it that we put our students in the situations to do. What, choose activities wisely, promote discussion and, and manage that discussion, guide it towards where we know the expert knowledge is. And then the curriculum really ought to be designed to promote engagement in this modeling process. That we ought to be designing activities so that students are, can engage in this process rather than just be uh, passive in the classroom or um, be, be just involved in, in accumulating information. So if that's the case, that's great. But then we need to have uh, an idea about what models are. And so I have assembled here some of the wonderful definitions that, that come from the literature. My, my advisor is, uh, was David Hestenis and his collaborator, Ibrahim Haloun. They, uh, Hestenis says, an abstract representation of structure, which is nice, but you know, it's got a nice beat, but I can't dance to it, you know? Um, Johnson Laird say that models mediate thought. And that's an interesting uh, thing to, to think about. Uh, Nancy Narcissian uh, talks about not models as constructs that stand in for actual phenomenon. And then there's a, a new group out of, um, in the biology uh, community that are talking about how models allow students to, to address new phenomena that they haven't, um, 
haven't dealt with. And so all of those are reasonable uh, definitions, but of course, um, so they, they probably all work, but I didn't say them, so I'm going to come up with my new model, uh, or my new definition. And um, so I'm going to say that a model is a purposeful, uh, coordinated set of representations of a particular class of phenomena that exist in the shared domain of discourse, which is a terrible definition. <laughs> but it fits on a t-shirt, and I think that it does three things. It tells you, where is it? What is it, what is it made of? Well, it's made up of uh, representations, and those representations are things like graphs and equations. And uh, if you were in uh, Dr. Spears' class today, you would have seen them learning one of these new representation. It was really fun. They have a purpose. They help us mediate thought. That part that Johnson Laird bring out is really important, is that they serve this purpose to help us think. And that, uh, and this is the part that I, is a little bit, um, it's out, it, this is on the edge, but that, that exists in the domain of social discourse. And I'm going to argue that this exists because the standard model of physics or the, the standard model of a model is the standard model, which is a really nice physics joke, but it really tells you that uh, people that are physicists have a model of what the standard model of the atom is, and it has representations, and you have one, and you have one, and I have one, and they're not all the same, but so if I kick off, the standard model persists, and so that that, this, that these models live outside of just individuals. And the reason that this is important is that there's a lot of discussion between, and so I'm gonna propose a, a, a model or an approach where the, this is, this is what I'm gonna say, is how models get built, all right? That uh, they start as these conceptual models very, with very specific situations. So, you know, a model of a marble rolling across a floor. And then it gets abstracted into something more general, something that goes beyond just marbles and floors. It maybe deals with constant acceleration situations. And that this goes on and on, and it happens through discussion. And that as, these, as we discuss these things, as we do these things, we build up our own individual versions of this model that exists in the inside of our brains and that these these mental models help us in the construction of this this process of uh, of social discourse uh, around model development and so i'm gonna this is the way i'm going to now that is the wonkiest way to talk about it let's talk about it more practically so uh, we instructionally, if that's what we think models are, and that's where we think they live, what would we do? Well, in physics, we would do sort of a four-thing uh, cycle. First is we would have them, we would have students develop a model. So consider some new phenomenon, uh, a ball bouncing, or um, you know, I, uh, would, today we did momentum. We would generate some new representations. Some of them would be mathematical. Some of them would be diagrammatic. They would uh, take on many different forms. We would come to some agreement on the meaning. And so part of the negotiation of what this model is, is what does it mean? What does it allow us to do? How does it allow us to mediate our thoughts? And then we would coordinate it with data. And eventually, we would establish sort of a, a very specific model of you know, a phenomenon. Today, the phenomenon was uh, well, give me an, uh, uh, skateboard, a girl on a skateboarder. Yeah. So we were, that's what they were working on today. And then, did I hit it twice? No, we're good. Okay. Once, once we have a model of a girl on a, a skateboard, we might want to abstract that out. We want, because not very many times do you actually need to deal with a girl on a skateboard. And if you had to have a new model for every situation, that's not a very efficient way of storing uh, information. So we need to abstract out, like, what are the salient features about this situation that could be applied to, you know, men on surfboards or 
uh, dogs on skateboards. All of the, the things that are salient, that are similar, that could be um, abstracted into these sort of general models, that's a really important component because that allows us to be, to make sure that they're useful. And then we have to make sure that they do this one thing, which is why physics is important, is that they must obey the laws of nature. They must obey conservation of momentum. If you have a model of momentum that doesn't obey conservation of momentum, it's not a very good model. Once we have these general models, the idea is to, to, to use them. This is the thing that physics is really good at, is, and this is where problem solving happens. Try this model in this new situation. Think about where, does it, where is it useful? How is it useful? What are the limitations on it? If the, genera if the answer is that it, it, uh, it shoots a, a skateboard out at 135 miles an hour, is that a useful model? Turns out, <laughs> Uh, we, we can do that. So, um, but understanding what the limits on this model are. And then, you know, to go back and revise it. So, hey, it works really well in one dimension. Does it work in two dimensions? Hey, this works really well for uh, when we treat things as particles. Does it work well when things uh, have physical extent? And so we have to think about how these models help us understand new phenomena which is nice abstractly, but what does it actually sort of look like? And so now I'm gonna try and talk about like the actual modeling instruction. And so here's a model. This is my, one of my graduate students took a picture of this. Uh, and this is a one dimensional, you know, constant acceleration situation. It's a train, I, I guess. It's speeding up, it's got constant velocity or a constant acceleration. It's represented in multiple ways. It's got equations that represent it. But it's also got uh, rules about how you use it, that you can interpret things from this, this set of tools, that the displacement's the area under that graph. This is why we have to negotiate the meaning of these models, is that that's not intu necessarily intuitively obvious, and it's built into the, the types of representations that we use. And so um, we're gonna talk a little bit more here on this side for now. We're gonna try and talk through some of what happens. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about modeling instruction uh, in practice. Uh, if you are interested, we have been developing curriculum materials for university physics. There's a QR code that should take you there. We'll see. Um, the work that I'm gonna be describing is from, is by and large from Florida International University. I've been at Drexel for three years now. Um, so at Florida International, the setup we had was we had this integrated lab and lecture, much like you do here. Um, it was five credits. It was there, it was four 50 minute lectures plus 165 minutes of lab. We took them, we took that total time, smushed it all together and divided it up into chunks, either two, three two hour blocks or, or two three hour blocks. Um, with one professor, we had graduate students, we had learning assistants, we had a classroom where there were three discussion groups with you know 25. So we had 75 students doing this in a large classroom. It was the full assignment and the grad student really got to serve as sort of an apprentice in instructor. Um, I got to Drexel and I had none of those benefits. I had terrible classrooms. Um, I don't have control over the lab, and so I have to do something different. And so at Drexel, I've been using uh, four credits where I take the two 50-minute lectures plus the 90-minute recitation, and I use that. That's what I've got, so that's what I'm doing. Uh, I do a two-hour block and a 90-minute block. Um, I do two hours of it, and my two graduate students do uh, an hour and a half of it, and we can make it work with about 60 students. Drexel is also on quarters, which means that I have to take everything. Notice there's a lot less time here. I have to do all of that, and I have to compress it into 10 weeks. So time is really, really important to me. And uh, we have common exams and uh, a common final. So I can't get behind. I don't have that luxury. I have to cover the same material as everyone else. So that's an important feature. but. 
I'm not going to talk about Drexel anymore because that's, that gives me heart palpitations sometimes. Um, so the cycle, this is this cycle. What does it look like in, in class? So in, there's sort of a, a way of thinking about the participation. So they do something initially. They do something, you know, whether it's a lab where they're all sort of, see, they're labbing, they're looking at things. Um, they might be doing a conceptual problem. They might do, be doing some uh, problem solving. But they do this in small groups on... Uh, these small portable whiteboards, you are probably familiar with them. Um, if you look really carefully at these whiteboards, uh, this was a staged thing. The photo guy couldn't make it during class. So this was learning how to turn on the equipment. It's kind of embarrassing. But they work on these small, uh, small whiteboards, and then they get together in what we call a board meeting. And they bring these whiteboards, and they discuss here. And so this is my, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Poffin. This is at Florida International. And they present, you know, these are the things we learned during that. And what that does is that's the time where we're working on agreeing what these models tell us. How do we use these models? All right? And so they do all kinds of discussion. Um, yeah, there it is. Turn on. <sighs> Couldn't we do better? Anyway, so they, and they go through this process where they go through this like participation cycle where they're small boards and large group and the group discussion is where as an instructor you spend a lot of time facilitating. Um, I find that it's helpful to actually show what this sort of looks like. And so uh, we have a, a clip, I have a video from uh, students working uh, so the, this is a place they've done uh, 1D and 2D kinematics, most of which are descriptive models. And this is a place where, as the instructor, your goal is to transition it from, predict or from descriptive to predictive. And so uh, the students have been working in, in a small group, and they're working on a lab that introduces energy. Um, and in this lab, a, a, a guess here, you've got a motion detecto, because the R got cut off. Um, you drop a ball, uh, and you've got a motion detector above it, and you watch the ball bounce. And the goal is to make a model for the motion of the ball as it goes through one full cycle. So as it falls down, hits the ground, and then comes back up. All right? And so uh, we're going to see a discussion here, um, a th about three-minute long discussion. There are four people that are involved in the discussion. Lara is one of our undergraduate learning assistants in this case, and she's doing all of the instruction. Uh, Marcus is right there. I know these people's real names, and this is not their real names, and it's hard to not say. Uh, Marcus is there, Amy is here, and that's Kurt. Um, and I, like I said, Vashti Sautel, uh, one of my first graduate students did all of the video transcription, subtitling, and all of the analysis, honestly. So, are we good with this? All right. Oh, that's too quiet in here. I am going to crank up the volume and hope. Ready? And it does have subtitles, so hopefully you can follow along. How would you model energy? Okay. 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 Okay.
So they are saying that the wrong pie and the blue pie and the wrong pie, right? Is potential pie. And it's falling, it's slowly changing to blue pie. And then when it reaches the ground, stop. It's blue. It's all blue pie. And as it hits, it loses some blue. It's reducing its blue pie. There's blueberry everywhere. There's blueberry everywhere because the elasticity of the ball is not complete. Because of pie fell. Because the pie fell. So we lose blueberry in sun and we lose blueberry in heat and we lose blueberry in all different forms of it. And then when it comes up, the bottom pie is it now? It's still blue pie coming up, but as it goes up, it goes back to brown pie. So brown pie is kinetic pie, and then no brown pie is potential pie. Okay. Wait, let's see. Let's define these types of words. So what exactly does potential or brown pie mean? All right. Blue pie. Blue pie is kinetic pie. Okay. Kinetic pie. Well, how would how would you explain it to my kid that she doesn't know anything about kinetic energy? It's the blue pie is due to motion and it's increasing it getting faster as it goes down. Okay. So it's increasing its energy so it gets more blue as you go down. Okay, that makes sense. Right? And then when it hits the ground, it's like all blue pie. All of it. All of it. Okay. So, right. so then when it comes back up, so it's changing back, back up. to cheer and back to brown pie. And that's potential pie. And that's potential pie. And then, so when it reaches the, 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 the highest, the highest point, it's peak. So when it's, it's all brown pie. pie. What? When you have the highest point that it reaches up from brown pie. It's all brown pie. And then when it goes back down, it's going back to blue pie. Okay, that makes sense. And that's blue and brown pie. Okay, how do you need you to explain that? That's negative acceleration. I'm not joking. And then you have... That's one of my favorites. Um, there, so, but what was happening there? Well, uh, the instructor had come around, and we had designed an activity that allowed them to explore a new model, a model that didn't fit with any of their existing models. They couldn't just use constant acceleration, because constant acceleration doesn't allow us to have things bounce back up. Something happens in the middle. And it also doesn't help us understand why it doesn't bounce back up all the way. And so the activity had been designed with the intent of pushing the models forward. And as we're going around and they're working in small groups, we're letting them know that they ought to be working on this new representation. We've introduced it to them and said, this is, this is uh, energy pie charts. This is a representation that allows you to keep track of the energy that is stored and transferred within this system. Now, this is their first time working with it. And I would say that they do a pretty good job of understanding the, the, how energy is transferred and stored within this system. There's things that could absolutely be better, but they do an um, admirable job of taking, this, uh, taking this, this tool that we've given them and appropriating it, taking it and making it their own. We never said anything about blueberry pie or brown pie. Marcus said so. And that's, I think, really sort of magical. And so I think this clip does a really nice job of talking about how this works. And I'd also like to give uh, props to uh, our learning assistant, Laura, because she did a great job, I think, allowing that discussion to happen. So that's what the classroom sort of looks like. And I'm going to sort of pivot now um, to, to research on the classroom and, and in the learning environment. Um, any, anyone that has done uh, some sort of active learning has compared their work to lecture students. And so this is us doing this. Um, our students come in uh, relatively similar. And at the end, our students had a much larger gain. Their raw gain was roughly twice as big. Um, as the students in the lecture class. This is an underestimate of the effect because the lecture class loses approximately 50% of its students. Who do they lose? They lose students who perform poorly. So this bar is probably artificially high. Uh, we also looked at how <laughs> I said that they lose 50% uh, of their students, roughly 50% of their students. This shows it, right? This is uh, success rates. So 
how many students are passing. And this was at Florida International, so we looked at male versus female. One of the things that I notice in this room that I think is wonderful is that the gender balance in this room is not the same as most physics colloquia. So I'm very happy you're all here. Um, most physics colloquia are about 80% men and 50% or 20% women. But we were seeing that the, the performance rate was, was relatively similar, male to female. And FIU uh, is 75% Hispanic students. So uh, ethnically, or on, based on ethnicity, we saw a relatively similar success rate. And that's an important result. We also saw, um, we also were the first group to show that uh, students' attitudes about learning physics can improve. One of the most robust results in physics education research is that introductory physics classes make students want to learn about physics less. So at the end of the class, they have less favorable attitudes towards learning physics, and this is problematic. But we showed that we were able to not only get positive results on this uh, instrument, the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey. Um, but we were able to show that we can do it across multiple classes and with multiple instructors. And so that suggests that it's not just one magical instructor, it's the curriculum. Um, we also saw how these, uh, how these attitudinal shifts uh, split. I mean, and one of the things that was pretty interesting is that we saw a much larger attitudinal gain by women than men um, and relatively similar across ethnic groups. Um, one of the reasons that I work with Caleb a lot is I do social network analysis. And so uh, at the beginning of one of the things that we did is we tried to look at student networks. Um, and so at the beginning of a lecture, one year we, we did this survey, we said, who is it that you work with to learn physics? And so this is the modeling instruction class. Um, and this is the lecture class. So the lecture class, all of these people over here, these are people said that they didn't work with anybody. But that's the beginning of the semester. That's what you might expect. These two are probably friends from high school. And this is, so look at the structure there. There's a lot more structure here, and uh, it's probably artificial. Our tables are six people. These people thought we were asking, who are you sitting with? That's a false positive. Um, this was a biology cohort. We didn't know we had them in the class, but this network analysis showed that, oh, we can see that these people all see each other like as, as part of their resources for learning physics. And one of the things that I've just found in the airport not too long ago is that two of the dot, those dots are now married. <laughs> At the end of the class, when we ask the exact same question, over here are all of the people in lecture that say they didn't work with anybody to learn physics. This lecture class added exactly one dyad. Whereas the modeling class, now notice, there's no one over here, so no one's isolated. And if you think, well, okay, that's cool, but how does that matter? Here's how it matters. Imagine for a second that you are this person and you need help on homework. Well, this person has one point where they can access. And if this person here doesn't happen to know, look at all the other steps that this person could make. So, this person, who is the least well-connected person in the classroom, is connected to this person, but secondarily connected to lots more people. Imagine now you're this person. You need help on homework. You can ask this person, but you don't have other means by which to go out and ask. Yes, you can form new connections. That's entirely plausible. But the most common thing for you to do is to use the connections that you already have. And so this idea is really important, is that the, these networks provide access to uh, information and um, we'll see momentarily how they, how they work out. Um, now, 
if you are very critical of me, and you should be, you should say, yeah, that grade thing is really interesting, but you give the grades, you can manipulate this, right? And that's a fair criticism. We should think very carefully about this. So what we did is uh, one of my former graduate students said, let's do uh, what's called a survival analysis. Let's see how do people that go through the modeling class and people that go through the lecture class, how do they fare as they go on in their degree program? And so we looked at uh, probabilities of success. And so number one, this is 12 semesters. Now 12 semesters is a long time because FIU takes a long time to graduate. Um, so after one semester, we see, a we see a drop. And it's a drop for students in the modeling class and the lecture class. And at the end of Modern Physics 2, we see a similar drop. But here, the modeling students pretty much level out. And it takes considerably longer for the students from the non-modeling classes to, to level out. And the, the modeling students end up with about an 85% probability of graduating, surviving to graduate, and lecture students have about 70%. Now, with the small n, those numbers are actually not statistically significantly different, but that's with small n. As time goes on, we'll see what happens with, uh, with those results. Um, one of my graduate students did this study about how, what representations people are using. And what we can see is that over the course of the modeling class, they learn to use a bunch of representations. They learn to use force diagrams. They use system schemas. They write out their assumptions. So they're building up these, they're using the representations that build up these models. And so what I hope that I have shown you is that we see We've designed this classroom and curriculum to help promote the building of students' conceptual models. And so now we're going to look at the right side, OK? We're going to look at, so here we've been looking at the effects. And now we're going to try and spend a minute just looking at um, what happens in actual brains. Uh, I work with uh, a group out of Florida International, um, particularly Angela Laird and Jessica Bartley, but a bunch of others, um, doing uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, so we had, in this fMRI process, you take the brain, you divide it up into billions of little uh, voxels. They're about, you know, depending on the, the strength of your magnet, they're about a two millimeter cube. And you measure the uh, level of uh, blood oxygenation in those, um, as students are doing some sort of task. And so I'm going to tell you about it. One study we did, I had 55 participants, all from the modeling class. 33 of them were male, 32 were or 22 were female. Um, they were all 18 to 25. Uh, we filtered on GPAs greater than 2.2, 4, and math, SAT math greater than 500. They are all right-handed because all, stu all studies, all fMRI studies are done on people that are right-handed. Did you know this? I didn't. I do now. Um, we give them a physics reasoning task uh, that is nine questions blocked into three, um, three chunks that are about uh, six, six minutes long. All right? So they get, three, they get basically three questions over the course of, um, oh, no, the nine question blocks, that's not quite right. Yes, it is. Nine question blocks that are, are four multiple choice questions. And I'll show you sort of what they look like. Um, we do two types of things. We do one, which is a test about physics reasoning. And so it's broken into three screens because it's actually really hard to understand what they're doing when they're, uh, we want to be certain we know what they're doing when they're answering the question. And so they've got a screen that's about, you know, a thing swinging around, blah, 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 string breaks, what happens? And so here they see a statement with a diagram. Here it asks the question, and here it provides the options. Um, it is only got four answers. One, the lowest, uh, mo the least common answer has been taken away because five button things in an FR MRI are very expensive. 
the things that you learn when you do science. So we also have a, com a control situation. So here, you know, these something about child playing with blocks and asking about the smallest block. We have um, we have another control that asks uh, students about um, about uh, you know things like what is Newton's third law, and so we can ask different sorts of questions. And so then you measure where there is greater levels of oxygen, uh, blood oxygenation. What this means is that you know your blood is your brain is like a muscle; it requires oxygen in order to to metabolize, and so. Um, we see things. So in red, we see task effects. So we see differences between when they're asked FCI questions and when they're asked just sort of regular reasoning type questions. And so the, the red blobs here, and red and orange, are these task effects. And the blue ones, oh, I should say what the task effects show us. So that we see that when, they, when these modeling students are reasoning, they're doing things um, and we, you then try and figure out, well, what do these brain regions do? Well, they, they are uh, important for attention, working memory, spatial reasoning, which I think is important. If we think a lot about what a, a model might tell us about, it might tell us a lot about how you are able to uh, manipulate these representations and reason based on you know, spatial features. And then mathematical cognition. And that's something that brain people talk about, but I don't really know what it is. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, in blue are the places where we see instruction effects. So at the end of the semester, do they, how are their brain oxygenation levels different than at the beginning of the semester? And so this really at to get us at like question of how are they, uh, how, what did they learn? Um, and so narrative comprehension, semantic processing, and then this one is the one that I think is really important, is that there's an area that is uh, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which talks about places where it generates and uh, manipulates these mental images. And so if you think about what a model might look like in a brain, it's sort of like a mental video that you can play around with. And so, I saw this and I was really excited. Now, this is no means uh, definitive answers, but I think it's exciting. And so what we can say is that students in these modeling instruction classes show neurobiological differences uh, in attention, working memory, spatial reasoning, mathematical cognition, and that they grow over the course of time through narrative comprehension, semantic processing, and generating and manipulating these mental images. Oh. oh, yeah. So, as we, as we wrap up, I'm going to say that science is a modeling endeavor. And that classes should be about having students build these models. That we ought to uh, think about how to, uh, that we can show uh, improvements on this using classes that have been taught according to this modeling of epistemology, and conceptual understanding, success, attitudes, networks, and that we are starting to develop evidence about students' neurobiological changes as a result of participating in modeling instruction. And so uh, we've got these learning environments focused on developing conceptual models. We see lots of uh, evidence of the conceptual models. We see effects of the conceptual models. We are starting to see neurobiological evidence and that they're consistent with this notion of these internal mental models that would be appropriate to talk about how an individual would hold a mental model rather than uh, a large, um, rather than having a conceptual model which is distributed across many people. And with that, I'll say thank you and shut up. Some time for questions. Um, does anyone want to pose a question for a speaker? Okay, so I'm actually a student in physics right now. Okay. I've enjoyed the modeling. Um, like different, I'm not sure. I don't know. Or 
with getting rid of Russia and actually doing modeling. But the only concern that I've had, and actually many of the students I've talked to have had a concern with, is the fact that we've sort of lost a basis of background knowledge. That's one thing that I've had an issue with, is because um, those students who have come in with physics previously um, have an idea of, oh, I remember this concept, I need to bring it back in. And then we're put into a classroom and we'll model, say for momentum, two buggies hitting each other in elastic, all the different positions. Yeah. And then you're given this test where it's like, okay, use all these different equations, solve for this, and you're like, what? <laughs> and then yeah. it throws you into a whole different thing. So I don't know how you would approach sort of so, I mean, let me first start with, that's an excellent co question and concern. Um, I've been told I'm supposed to repeat questions that I can't repeat the whole question. But the question was about, um, do we have relevant background knowledge in, uh, and that, that are we allowed to use that in these new testing situations that sometimes match up really well and sometimes don't, right? Uh, yeah, this is a problem that we are encountering right now at Drexel. Um, I w can tell you about experiences at Florida International in Hawaii and in, when I was previously in Hawaii, uh, which are that uh, we were really thoughtful about if we're going to introduce new tools, we ought to expect that they are part of the assessments. So, you know, if you introduce force diagrams but then never assess, students' skill at using force diagrams to interpret or to generate force diagrams, you're telling them in a less direct way, hey, these don't matter that much. What really matters is the mathematics, right? And so we were really thoughtful about like, oh, if we're going to do this, we really have to commit to it. We have to put these things on the tests. And we have to, and the other thing we did, and this was, um, I said that learning is, you know, a participatory sport. You have to be engaged. You have to be active. Well, if we want that to happen, we have to test in that way. And so we would do one test as individuals, and then the second test was a group exam. Because that we said, if we're going to teach this way, we have to commit to this really, really seriously. And, uh, you know, there's, there's some general unease about that, but actually it winds up being a lot more fun and people contribute in ways that you might not expect. Um, but yeah, there's, you know. Oh, I understand it. I'm having a great time working with everyone in the groups. And then it's like, okay, you get three tests, there's 60% of your group. Yeah. You add on that stress, and then it's like, you just get hit with it. And you're like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because my students are in this exact same position right now where they are, all of our classes are designed to be coordinated. So there are four sections running at once and we have common exams, but I'm the only one doing this. And so I, I want to see, you know, are they using it to solve problems? And what we know about expert problem solving is that experts have multiple ways of solving any given problem and, you know, multiple uh not only multiple approaches, but they utilize multiple representations in doing so. So you're maybe more expert, even if it's not being, not the thing that's being asked for on an exam. So uh, from the part of the research team, we're researching uh, different types of teaching methods, you can analyze the uh, top down to bottom up method. Um, as you were going through your modeling uh, teaching, uh, modeling teachings, I kind of thought of it more as a top-down approach. Where you're posing a question to a group of students, and they're um, kind of generalizing and putting it into their own words and trying to figure it out that way. Um, but then I kind of realized that it could be a bottom-up because other students are in that group and they're allowed to talk amongst themselves. So, would you? towards the fact that this could be bridging the gap between the top-down and the bottom-up approach. Yeah. yeah um, so when I think about modeling, I actually think about it as a model, as a middle-out um, sort of approach. And there's a variety of reasons for, for talking about this. But, uh, oh, so the question was, is this a top-down or bottom-up 
approach and is modeling and instruction a way of bridging. So I think of it um, as a middle out um, where uh, instructionally, sometimes the students are leading and introducing new ideas, and sometimes the instructors, through the design and choice of activities that they do, are guiding the, you know, like the sort of, you know, uh, what is it? In, in economics, they call it the animal spirits. Well, in modeling instruction, the design and, and selection of the activities is sort of the animal spirits carrying the, the curriculum along. And that those two meet in the classroom, and, and they have to. Um, because student, I have my set of models. I don't really add much to my set of models. But the students have lots of space to grow. And so this is a place where it's for them. You know, it's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to go back to your previous <clears throat> comments. Uh, in constructing my assessments, I, I attempt to break up the test into about a quarter graphical, a quarter diagrammatic, a quarter mathematical, a quarter descriptive. And what recently I've been asking students to, there's a combination of multiple choice and workout problem. I've been asking students for multiple choice to explain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and actually, I yes, because I think that the job of a physics instructor is to to in some ways certify that students have been through this class, have some knowledge about physics, and if that's my job, I need to be collecting that evidence. What's my evidence that they know how to do these things? And so. I like to have them, you know, give, I'd, I'd rather have them do one problem really thoroughly and explain how they're doing it and why they're making the choices that they're making. And there's a second benefit to this, and it's one that is, is apparent, abundantly clear to me at this point, which is that uh, we use Mastering Physics, which is an online homework system. Um, and every one of the problems is Googleable. You can find the solution. And there's a new thing where you don't even have to type in the thing. You can take a picture of the problem, and it'll Google it for you. This is, sometimes the answers are wrong. But I mean, so our job is to think about what are the ways that we can collect evidence about students' understanding. And the only way I know how to do it is to have them write, to have them say, this is how I'm doing. This is why. This is why I'm using this. This is why I'm going from here to there. This is why the graduate students at Drexel University are going to hate me because I'm taking away mastering physics in two years because I'm going to start asking them to grade weekly problem sets because I don't have any. I mean, we get a hundred percent on our mastering physics homework portion of our grade. Every student has a hundred percent. When you put one of the problems straight, you copy it off of Mastering Physics and you put it on a written test, they don't know what to do. There's no way of correlating. It. It's unbelievable. And so this, they're not, I don't, I don't believe that that Mastering Physics has any evidence. And so the place that you should look for evidence is in their reasoning and in their writing. That's, yeah, I totally agree with that. And anyone in here that I just screwed up what their next test's going to be like, I'm really sorry. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. I guess in, in um, thinking about your students uh, starting off in your class the first couple of days, um, I, I'm going to guess they're probably not very familiar with um, how the class runs. Yeah. Um, so once upon a time when I had an entire semester, uh, it, it would go like, I would spend a day of like doing stuff. If you only have 10 weeks, you have to be teaching that very first class. You have to be. So the very first thing we do is I say, okay, this is who I am. Here's the syllabus. Let's go. And I say, I, I say that you've got to be active. 
um, this class is different. It, uh, my reputation, so last year was really hard for me because I'd never done it at Drexel. This year it's easier, and I think it's because word of mouth has gotten out that, hey, you're gonna do things that are different in this class. And people, I, I think once upon a time it was a much worse problem. Um, I think high school kids are getting a lot more active learning at this point, and so they're much more primed for, for this sort of thing. It's, it's certainly not universal, but I, that's, I mean, if I were to like guess, that's what's happening. Um, but ideally you would, you would do a non-confrontational activity, like have, create instructions on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And, you know, something like that, where they allow them to screw up on something that they should know, you know? Um, so you've done a lot of work in the university setting. Um, I know modeling has sort of taken over the high school setting as well. Um, what differences do you think there are between sort of a college, high school, and maybe even lower in like middle school? Um, do you see there? So I mean, the under the question is about the differences between college, high school, and middle school. The idea is, I mean. The, the fundamental theory is that it doesn't speak to age or even discipline. And so that if modeling is really a science, if science really is a modeling endeavor, then it should work across all settings, right? And so um, epistemologically, there shouldn't be much difference. There are gonna be obvious differences. Uh, in terms of you know language and how you what tools you might use and I might use calculus but they won't right but fundamentally the idea should be the same now um, there's a difference in the ways in which materials have been developed and the high school modeling project uh, developed a lot of materials really really high quality materials and they did so at a time um, when computers were just coming into the classroom. And so there's you know, some really interesting things there. One of the things that we're working on now is trying to think about how can we engage more um, computational thinking and compu like simulation and computation in the classroom because our students are ready for it and they, they'll benefit from it. And so these things are never solved problems. Um, and I know that's not really an answer to your question. But uh, there are differences in the materials, but those are mostly historical. Yes. Have you had much success persuading colleagues to adopt this model? As a model? <laughs> well, I made some really dumb decisions, and I'm trying to make better decisions at this point. Um, you remember that slide? There's this. I gotta find it because it, it. No, that's not it. Yeah, this is the one. Uh, okay. So imagine that you are a professor that is lecturing. You believe me. I've got tons of evidence, right? My data is good, and there's real differences. But you're a professor that is teaching four 50-minute lectures. And all of a sudden, I'm asking you to do 365 minutes. What do you tell me? No, thank you. <laughs> even if you care, even if you're committed, even if you believe, it doesn't work. So in my new approach, I've been saying, I will not do something unless I can make it so that someone can come in and spend the exact same amount of time and do something differently. And so I think that that's a big problem. I mean, that's like a, a dumb decision that I made. And you know, w there were a bunch of people that were involved in this, but we really should have thought that one through. Um, and it took me being a lecturer for two years to realize, oh, this is a really easy job. Like, it's really nice to just do, give two 50-minute lectures per week. I did no prep. <laughs> It was amazing. I had so much time. Um, but I'm doing things differently now. And so I think we're going to try and develop a curriculum approach that you know, doesn't require a special classroom and doesn't require 
um, lectures to spend more than two hours a week. And that will help us. We're going to have to build up some stuff. We're going to have to build up professional development for TAs. We're going to have to build up the materials so that they're more self-explanatory. Um, but we're, we're working towards it. We're working towards it. And we're going to have to redevelop our data because it's not clear that this will have the same impacts. But we're in the process of doing that. And, and Jamie has said, show me the evidence. Show me. And he's right, you know. That's all the time. Well, thank you very much. I really have enjoyed this. <laughs>